Hello class 12. With this video we are going to discuss atomic physics. We are going to start atomic physics and of course we begin with Rutherford alpha ray scattering experiment. Now I believe you've studied about alpha ray scattering experiment in your chemistry also. So this will be kind of a recap for you. Now what was done in this experiment is that alpha particles which are helium nuclei and they were positively charged member. So a lot of alpha particles were made incident on a very thin gold foil. Okay, this experiment actually were, it was performed by two students of Rutherford, Giga and Marston. All right, and like I said, a lot of alpha particles were made incident on a gold foil, and it was seen that most of the alpha particles it traveled undeviated. It passed through the gold foil undeviated. And there were only very few alpha particles which got deviated by 90 degrees or by about 180 degrees, even lesser by 180 degrees. All right, it was the number of uh, alpha particles getting scattered by 90 degrees or 180 degrees is like one in 10,000. So very few amount of alpha particles got scattered by about 90 degrees and like I said even lesser by 180 degrees and most of the alpha particles they traveled they passed through the gold foil undeviated and there were certain important conclusions that were drawn now why very important conclusions is because why was this experiment very important is because at that point of time People didn't know what the atom looked like. Today we know atom has a nucleus with, with you know electrons surrounding it, different orbits going around about the nucleus. Also, the nucleus being made up of neutrons and protons. Today we know that. But at that point of time, people had no idea whatsoever about what the atom is like. Dalton's atomic theory was there, and according to Dalton's atomic theory, the atom was indivisible. And they had no picture whatsoever about what the atom looked like. So people were coming up with all sorts of their own theories, different kinds of structures, different kinds of models people were giving for the, you know, uh, the structure of the atom. So this is a very, very important experiment. And the kind of conclusion that were drawn was that an atom is mostly hollow. Now, why Rutherford said atom is mostly hollow? Because most of the alpha particles which are helium nuclei positively charged member most of the helium nuclei they are passing through undeviated to the gold foil and thereby the gold foil in itself being made up of millions of atoms and since most of the atoms are hollow okay so the most part of the most part of an atom is hollow so the helium nucleus was simply passing through the atom and thereby the gold foil that is why a very very important conclusion atom is mostly hollow then the second important conclusion is that uh, since helium nuclei they themselves are positively charged and some were getting scattered by 90 degrees or 90 degrees and some there were some which were getting scattered by very small angles very very small angles like this so anyway, since the alpha particles were getting scattered, they get scattered because of repulsion. There has to be some repulsive force which deflects them from their actual path. So since helium nuclei, nuclei they themselves being positively charged, there has to be a positive part in the atom. That is what Rutherford concluded. And he said most of the positive charge and since he has already concluded the atom to be mostly hollow so most of the positive charge in fact the whole of the positive charge and most of the mass of an atom should be concentrated in a very small space that is what Rutherford concluded and he named this small space the nucleus and thereby Rutherford is the discoverer of the nucleus remember so he said, since most of the alpha particles are passing through, so the atom should be hollow. And since some alpha particles are getting deflected or scattered by angles like 90 degrees, 90 degrees, there has to be a positive charge, positive part of the nucleus. 
which is concentrated in a very small point, which is called the nucleus. And he also said that almost the whole of the mass of the atom is also concentrated in that particular nucleus. So that was conclusion number two. Very, very important conclusion. These are the two most important conclusions. Now, uh, what the third one says is, now, not just a gold foil, then after, after he drew these two conclusions, he also uh, scattered alpha particles in other different metallic plates like silver, platinum, okay, and he found out that the number of alpha particles that get scattered by different amounts, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, it's different for different metals. The number of alpha particles getting scattered, it was different for different metals. He found it to be different for different metals. Although most of the alpha particles were passing through those metallic plates also like silver and platinum. So since the number of alpha particles getting scattered by 90 degrees, 90 degrees was different for different metallic plates, he further concluded that the magnitude of the positive charge in the nucleus for different metallic plates is different. And that is exactly what you find to be true today. So he said that for different metallic plates, the magnitude of the positive charge in their nuclei is different. Another very important conclusion. And the final one, he said Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law, electrostatics, remember? Okay, positive charges repel and unlike charges attract and the magnitude of force given by 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught q 1 q 2 by r square Coulomb's law. So that Coulomb's law holds for atomic distances also. That was conclusion number 4. So these three are the most important conclusions for Rutherford alpha ray scattering experiment. So after alpha ray scattering experiment came Rutherford's atomic model. I already told you there were so many different atomic models that were being given at that point of time. Okay, there was something like, you know, plum pudding model also. That is one thing I remember, okay. So, you know, uh, so what Rutherford's atomic model told us is most of the positive, the whole of the positive charge and most of the mass was concentrated very in a very small point. So this is a highly magnetic picture. Right? So we have the positive charges and most of the mass concentrated and most of the space is hollow. So you have hollow spaces. So another orbit could be something over here, hollow spaces. And he first, so that was point number one. He said then after the electrons revolve around the nucleus in different orbits. So that is what he said. Electrons were already discovered by that point of time. Protons and neutrons were discovered later. Okay, so before Rutherford discovered nucleus, electrons were already discovered. In later 1800s, 1890s something, electrons was discovered. <coughs> so, electrons, negatively charged electrons, Rutherford said, they revolve around the nucleus in different orbits. Now, why did he see the electrons have to revolve around the nucleus? Because if the electrons were considered to be stationary, they would readily be attracted by the positive charge of the nucleus, following Coulomb's law, of course. Okay, that is why he said the electrons, they have to go revolving around the nucleus in different orbits. He did not say anything about the number of electrons in different orbits. Okay, and he also said that the number of negatively charged electrons, it has to be equal to the number of positive charge in the nucleus such that the atom on the whole is electrically neutral. So this was Rutherford's atomic model. And you can see how similar it is, this atomic model is with what we have accepted today, the atomic model that we have accepted today. Right? Of course, it had its uh, failure, it has its demerits, this uh, Rutherford's atomic model. Now, we are going to discuss about that also. Then after comes Bohr's atomic model with a few corrections to this, so to say. So, talking about the failure of Rutherford's atomic model, it had two main failures. One, regarding the stability of the atom. Because uh, the atomic model which Rutherford gave, it was not stable. Why? Because you have the nucleus here, 
with its positive charges of course and we have different electrons according to uh, Rutherford going round about the nucleus in different orbits. Now Maxwell's electromagnetic theory it was already proven. Now according to Maxwell's electromagnetic theory whenever you have an accelerating charged particle what happens is it starts emitting energy that is what Maxwell's theory tells us. So an electron which is a charged particle going round about in circular orbits is it being accelerated a charged particle being accelerated. So Maxwell's theory which was already proven which tells us that accelerated charged particle should constantly go on emitting energy okay so this electron which is accelerating is constantly losing energy in the form of radiation. So when this electron goes on losing its energy, what should happen to this electron is it should go on describing circular orbits of gradually decreasing radii. Eventually what happens is this electron collapses into the nucleus and thereby the atom therefore is not stable. This is true for any electron. So therefore, the atom, Rutherford's atomic model was not stable. And the other thing is, it could not explain atomic line spectra. Now, when you know uh, atomic spectrum was observed using you know complex, uh, not complex, using instruments called uh, spectrometer. So what was seen is the spectrum, the atomic spectrum was linear like this different colored, different colored or some are invisible to the human eye also, okay, just a sec. So the atomic spectrum that was observed was like this, okay, differently colored. It won't be white of course, okay, but uh, uh, just to show that it's a different color. So atomic spectrum was like this, all right. And Rutherford's atomic model could not explain this linear spectrum. Now, according to uh, this model, since an accelerated charge constantly goes on radiating energy, giving out energy, so this is the radiation according to Rutherford's atomic model. Since the loss in energy in the form of radiation is continuous, because the electron goes on losing energy continuously, so it should not be a line spectrum like this. It should be a constant spectrum. A constant spectrum should be seen. Not one over here, one over here. It should not be like that. Okay, it should not be linear like this. It should be a constant, it should be a band kind of a spectrum that should be seen according to Rutherford's atomic model. But we do not see a continuous band kind of a spectrum. We rather see one over here, one over here, one over here, like that, at certain intervals, certain gaps. So Rutherford atomic model could not explain this. This is actually what is seen. Okay, so this is where Rutherford's atomic model fails. So let us now finally discuss Bohr's atomic model. This is the atomic model that we've stuck to so far. Okay, so. He made certain corrections in Rutherford's atomic model and he said that electrons, according to Rutherford's atomic model, the electrons could revolve in any of the orbits outside the nucleus. But Bohr put certain restrictions or conditions to it and he said that electrons cannot revolve in any of the orbits that they feel like. Electrons can only revolve in certain orbits where the value of angular momentum of the electron is an integral multiple of h by 2 pi, where h of course is a Planck's constant. So this is the condition that he, you know, used. So electrons can only revolve in those orbits where their angular momentum has to be an integral multiple of h by 2 pi. So mvr is the angular momentum where r is the radius of the orbit m is the mass of the electron, v is the velocity of the electron in that particular orbit of course. So angular momentum of the electron equal to nh by 2 pi, 
where n is called your principal quantum number. n is 1 for the first orbit, 2 for the second orbit, 3 for the third orbit, like that. And these orbits where the angular momentum of the electron is integral multiple of h by 2 pi, these orbits were called stable orbits. So, 1 is the uh, principal quantum number for the first stable orbit, second stable orbit, 3 for the third stable orbit and so on and so forth. He further said that, see, uh, one of the reasons for Rutherford's atomic, the failure of Rutherford's atomic model is that the electrons did not obey Maxwell's theory, in which case the, you know, accelerated charged particles should go on radiating or losing energy in the form of a photon. Now he said, although Maxwell's theory is true, while electrons are revolving in stable orbits, well this is true, stable orbits, electrons do not radiate any energy. That is what he said. Although they are being accelerated, although electrons being charged particle and they being accelerated, they do not lose energy while revolving in stable orbits. He didn't give any specific reason for that, he only said that. To make the atom stable. So that is a correction he made. A very you know smart and you know intelligent correction so to say and furthermore he said that electrons can jump from one orbit to the other and he said whenever electrons jumps from a higher orbit to a lower orbit it loses energy in the form of a photon so that is what he said so if e2 is the energy of the higher orbit e1 is the energy of a lesser orbit so he said e2 minus e1 is equal to h nu where h nu is the energy of the photon and this is the difference in the energy of the two orbits so from here the frequency of the photon that is emitted is e2 minus e1 divided by h okay so Bohr's atomic model uh, could could uh, explain the stability of the atom also now the atomic after Bohr's atomic model so to say is stable also because the electrons are not losing energy in the form of radiation although they are being accelerated so uh, so this is for the stability of the atom and this is for the line spectrum now why are we seeing line spectrum we are seeing line spectrum only when an electron jumps from a higher orbit to a lower orbit not at any other point of time Okay, so only when electron jumps from a higher orbit to a lower orbit, we get to see a spectrum, we get to see light, we get to see a photon. Okay, so that this point explains for the line spectrum, remember. So, in whatever points the Rutherford atomic model failed, so Bohr's atomic model could successfully explain for those failures and that is why we are sticking to Bohr's atomic model like I said earlier till today also. So let us now talk about hydrogen like atoms and apply Bohr's theory to it. Now what are hydrogen like atoms in the first case? Atoms like hydrogen of course which only have one electron on their outermost orbit like lithium, sodium are hydrogen like atoms. Okay so According to Bohr's theory, an electron is going round above the nucleus. So when it goes round above the nucleus, there has to be some centripetal force acting on it. So what provides the centripetal force for the electron such that it goes round and round above the nucleus? The force which provides the centripetal force is your electrostatic attraction between the nucleus and the electron. So, mv squared by r, the left hand side is the centripetal force, where r is the radius of the orbit in which the electron is going round about, the nucleus. And the right hand side comes from your Coulomb's law, that is the electrostatic force, 1 by 4 by epsilon naught. Ze is the charge of the nucleus, and E is the charge of the electron going round about the nucleus, the electron that you are focusing on, divided by r squared, the radius squared. So simplifying, you can do the mathematics actually yourself. So this R and one of the R's from here, they divide each other out and we get mv squared is equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught, ze squared by R, 
That is our equation number one. Let us see. And now, from Bohr's theory, we get the angular momentum of the electron in the stable orbit has to be integral multiple of h by two pi. That is, that comes from the that comes from Bohr's postulate. So, squaring this equation, we get m squared v squared r squared is equal to m squared h squared by four pi squared. Let's see. That is our equation number two. Now, what you do is you divide equation two by equation one. This equation is to be divided by this equation. You do the math yourself, and you will see it comes out to be m r squared is equal to n squared h squared epsilon naught r divided pi z e squared. Divide this equation two by equation one, and furthermore simplify this r and this r. One of the r's here they divide each other out, and what you get is the expression for the radius of the stable orbits around which electrons can. Go round about the nucleus. So the expression for the radius is n squared h squared epsilon naught divided by m pi z e squared. So, like I said, this is the expression for radius of stable orbits, and we see that h epsilon naught m pi z e squared all are constants. Where z, of course, is what? It is the atomic number. Do not forget. So uh, we get to see since all of these are constants, we can write r is proportional to n squared. That is the ratio of the permitted orbits. Ratio of the radius. I forgot to write radius. Ratio of the radii of permitted orbits or that of stable orbits will be what? Like what? One is to four is to nine is to sixteen is to twenty-five is to thirty-six and goes on. Okay. That is, if the radius of the first orbit is one, the radius of the second stable orbit has to be four. That of the third stable orbit has to be nine. That of the fourth stable orbit has to be sixteen, and so on. Now, let us focus on Bohr radius. Now, what is Bohr radius? Bohr radius is the radius of the first orbit of hydrogen, first stable orbit of hydrogen. Now, for hydrogen, the atomic number z is one, and for hydrogen, the principal quantum number is one, since we are only talking about one of the Radii of hydrogen, the first orbit of hydrogen. So n has to be one, the principal quantum number. The uh, we are calling it R one Bohr radius. We are calling it R one. So R one is what? N squared from this expression. N squared epsilon naught divided by m pi e squared. Z is also one. N is also one. And all our constants, as you can see, m is the mass of the electron, nine point one into ten to the power minus thirty one kilogram. E is one point six into ten to the power minus nineteen. Pi is pi, 3.14. Planck's constant, epsilon naught, permittivity of free space. Do not forget, and it comes out to be when you substitute the values, it comes out to be 0.53 angstrom. So Bohr radius, that is the radius of the first orbit of hydrogen, is 0.53 angstrom, or 0.53 into 10 to the power minus 10 meters. All right. So if the first orbit of hydrogen Is 0.53 angstrom. What will be the second? What will be the value? If there is a second stable orbit, what will be its value? It will be four times this value. Four times 0.53. What will be the value of the third stable orbit of hydrogen? It will be nine times 0.53 angstrom. Fourth stable orbit will be 16 times 0.53 angstrom, and so on. So this is about the radius of the stable orbits. Now let us calculate the velocity of the electron in different stable orbits. Now we already know that the radii of the the expression for the radii of the stable orbits is given by this equation. Let's call that equation number three. Now from Bohr's postulate, that is the angular momentum has to be integral multiple of h by two pi. From there we get v is n h by two pi m r. We are bringing m r to the right hand side. And goes in the denominator, of course. That is our equation number four. Now we substitute for r in equation number four from equation number three. We substitute this value of r in here, and we get n h by two pi m into m pi z e squared by. You see the mathematics yourself, okay? Substituting the value of r, <clears throat> and then simplifying, we get v is equal to z e squared by two h epsilon naught into one by And so this is the general expression for velocity of an electron in different stable orbits, and we can see that 
you know since z e h epsilon naught all are constants so we can write v is proportional to 1 upon n that is the velocity of the electrons in different stable orbits is inversely proportional to the principal quantum number or in other words higher the value of the orbits greater the radius of the orbits lesser and lesser will be the velocity of the electrons that is the velocity of the electron is the fastest in the first orbit so electron revolves with the fastest possible velocity in the first orbit and thereby gradually as we go higher up the orbits the velocity of the electrons goes on decreasing now let us calculate the electro the velocity of the electron in the first orbit of hydrogen where z is equal to 1 atomic number 1 to number so in that case for the first orbit let's call that v1 v1 will be how much z is 1 so e squared divided by 2 h epsilon naught n is also 1 so v1 is e squared by 2 h epsilon naught all are constants substitute their values and we get to see the velocity of the electron in the first orbit of hydrogen is 2.19 into 10 to the power 6 meters per second we call this velocity of course comparable to, to that of light okay it's a very fast velocity if you look at this order 10 to the power 6 times you know 10 per 6 meters per second we can't even think about this speed all right so this is the velocity of electron in the first orbit of hydrogen now there's something called fine structure constant sometimes you know you might be asked about what is fine structure constant it is of course as you can see a constant denoted by an alpha and it is the ratio of the velocity of the electron in the first orbit of hydrogen divided by the velocity of light so fine structure constant alpha is v1 by c which of course is equal to e squared by 2 h epsilon naught into c so is c is in the denominator so v1 is this much 2.19 in 10 to power 6 meters per second the velocity of light is 3 to 10 to power 8 meters per second now when you simplify you get to see that the fine structure constant comes out to be equal to 1 upon 137 so sometimes you might just be asked about the fine structure constant and you should be remembering this so this is about the velocity of electrons in different stable orbits now talking about energy of an electron in stationary orbits or stable orbits we know energy is the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy now kinetic energy for an electron is of course given by half mv squared now this was our equation number one if you remember where mv squared is z e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r so substituting for mv squared over here we get the kinetic energy of the electron in stationary orbits to be z e squared divided by 8 pi epsilon naught r likewise we calculate for the potential energy potential energy expression we have learned how to calculate potential energy you know in electrostatics itself so potential energy is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 since this is the negative charge this is the electron so minus e divided by r the distance so this comes out to be the potential energy comes out to be minus z e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r and thereby the total energy is the sum of kinetic and potential energy e is given by kinetic energy plus potential energy and thereby it comes out to be minus z e squared divided by 8, 8 pi epsilon naught r See that is our equation number 5. I believe that is equation number 5. I just uh, forgot the numbering of the equation. <clears throat> so now in this equation what we do is we substitute for r. We've already calculated the, you know, the value of r, the radius in stationary orbits and it has come out to be n squared h squared epsilon naught divided by pi mz e squared. Okay, I believe this was equation number 3. So when we substitute for r from this equation in equation number 5, what we get is, you can try doing this yourself, the energy comes out to be minus mz squared e to the power 4 divided by 8 epsilon naught squared h squared into 1 by n squared. So this is the general expression for energy of electrons in different stationary orbits. And you get to see that as the value of the principal quantum number n increases, the value of the energy goes on increasing. That is higher the orbit, more is the value of energy.
Now from this expression for energy, if say we are talking about a higher energy state or an excited state, the energy of the higher energy state is E2 and the energy of the lower energy state is E1. So we've learned from Bohr's theory that whenever an electron jumps from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, it loses energy in the form of a photon. So it emits a photon and loses thereby its energy whenever it jumps from a higher orbit to a lower orbit. So the difference in energy E2 minus E1 using this expression of course is given by mz squared e to the power 4 divided by 8 epsilon naught squared h squared into 1 by n1 squared minus 1 by n2 squared. You substitute for e2, substitute for e1 and then subtract you will get to see this. Okay, so this difference in energy between the two orbits, two states, is given by is equal to h nu, is liberated in the form of a photon. And therefore, the frequency of the photon is given by this thing mz squared e to the power 4 divided by 8 epsilon naught squared h cube now, and the same thing inside the bracket. So, this is the frequency of the emitted photon. Now, uh, the photon will also have a wavelength, so the expression for the wavelength can be written as 1 by lambda, this is the inverse of wavelength to be more precise. So 1 by lambda is nu by c, which is this whole expression divided by c itself, and thereby we have a c in this expression in the denominator as you can see. You can work out the mathematics yourself, okay? And by the way, this inverse of the wavelength is also called wave number. That is the number of waves per unit length. So 1 by lambda is also called wave number. What is the number of complete waves per unit length? So that is what is called wave number. Remember, so 1 by lambda is mz squared e to the power 4 divided by 8 epsilon naught squared c h cube into 1 by n1 squared minus 1 by n2 squared. So this is your wave number. Now, the wave number can also be written in terms of a new constant, which is called Rydberg's constant. Let me first write, show you what is the Rydberg's constant. Rydberg's constant. So, Rydberg's constant is denoted by a capital R, and this capital R is equal to m e to the power 4 divided by the thing that is in the denominator, 8 epsilon naught squared c h cube. So let me erase our expression for energy here that we've derived already. So the Rydberg's constant r is m e to the power 4 divided by 8 epsilon naught squared c h cube. Everything is a constant over here. Mass of an electron, charge of an electron, epsilon naught, velocity of light, Planck's constant, everything is a constant. Okay, so instead of writing uh, these things again and again, we replace it by a single constant denoted by a capital R, which is called Rydberg's constant. And if you substitute the value of each of these constants and calculate the value of R, it comes out to be 1.09 into 10 to the power 7. And if you check the unit, it will be meter inverse. So the value of Rydberg's constant is 1.09 into 10 to the power 7 meter inverse mind you. So this whole expression for wave number can also be written in terms of the Rydberg's constant. So what you have here is z squared r. Alright, so z squared is still there. So z squared r into 1 by n1 squared minus 1 by n2 squared. So this is the expression for wave number in terms of the Rydberg's constant and the value of Rydberg's constant is this. Now after this, uh, so this is all the calculation for you know the radius of stationary orbits or stable orbits, the velocity of an electron in stationary orbits or stable orbits and we also calculated the expression for energy of electrons in different stable orbits and thereby the difference in energy or whenever an electron jumps from high energy state to lower energy state, the emission of the energy in the form of photon. So this is the calculation for it. Now what we will do is, final thing, we are going to discuss hydrogen spectrum or so to say line spectrum. And we will see line spectrum in terms of the wave number. Let us now talk about the hydrogen spectrum.
the linear spectrum, the line spectrum that we see when we observe, say, we have a hydrogen gas in a discharge tube, okay, and we maintain a very high potential difference between the two ends of the discharge tube. So what happens is there is a high potential difference and you have hydrogen gas inside the discharge tube. So what happens is the uh, atoms in the hydrogen gas, they get excited or rather the you know uh, electrons in the hydrogen it gets excited and it rises to a higher energy state now in the higher energy state the electrons only stays there for about 10 to the power minus 8 seconds and readily it comes down to the lower energy state now whenever it comes down to the lower energy state what happens is it emits a photon and you know that photon we want to observe that photon using a spectroscope now some of the photons will fall in the infrared region, I mean, yeah, infrared that is invisible to us, some falls in the ultraviolet region which is invisible to us, okay. Only something called your Barma series fall in the visible spectrum which we can observe, okay. So what we will see is, we will see, using a spectroscope, we will see differently, differently colored lines like this. Some lines could be closer, okay, some will be farther apart, lines, different lines, like this. So this is what is called a line spectrum. Remember that. Okay. Now, so you must have studied this in your chemistry also. The first one is Lehmann series. We have seen that for hydrogen, uh, like atoms, the wave number or inverse of the wave width is given by R Z squared one by n one squared minus one by n two squared. This is what we have seen. Now for hydrogen. The value of atomic number is 1 and therefore it becomes for hydrogen R into 1 by N1 squared minus 1 by N2 squared. Now what is this Lehmann series? So you have hydrogen atom, so there are different energy levels, different orbits so to say. The orbits are also expressed in terms of straight lines like this, parallel lines like this. Okay, so these are called energy levels, energy states. So these are the same orbits remember. So this is your n equal to 1, this is the n equal to 2, this is the n equal to 3, this is the n equal to 4. So whenever an electrons jump from any higher energy state to the first orbit, so whenever say electron jumps from the second orbit to the first orbit, whenever electron jumps from the third orbit to the first orbit, or from the fourth orbit to the first orbit, or from any other higher energy state, the fifth orbit, the sixth orbit, to the first orbit, the first orbit, the, or the first energy state, lowermost energy state is also called the ground state. So whenever it jumps to the ground state, it, it obviously it emits photon in every you know uh, fall when from whichever level it be, from whichever energy state it be, it releases photon. It comes from the third orbit, it releases photon. Okay, we can observe this. So this is what we are observing, the photon that is coming out. So this is your limit series. Whenever electron jumps from any higher energy state, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, to the first energy level, the ground state. That is, that is what is called the limit series. Now all lines that we see in limit series falls in the ultraviolet region, which is, it is not visible to us. It falls in the ultraviolet region region. The spectrum that you know uh, actually is there in Lehmann series we cannot see that of course because it falls in the ultraviolet region. Likewise Balma series whenever electron jumps from any higher energy state any higher energy state but to the second state from n equal to 3 it releases photon from n equal to 4 to n equal to 2 it releases a photon okay so whenever there is a fall in the second energy state or second orbit from any other higher energy state this is not 2 sorry this is 3 4 5 and so on this is 4 5 6 yeah 4 5 6 i've missed up everything here all right so whenever it falls from third fourth fifth or any other higher energy orbit to the second orbit that falls in the balma series and the line spectrum that we get in balma series falls in the visible region okay not falls in the visible region all right now
Now, whatever line spectrum we get in the bottom series falls in the visible region. Okay, this can be seen, so to say. Now, Pustin series, whenever electron jumps from any higher energy state, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, okay, to the third energy state, that is your Pustin series. Whenever electron jumps from any higher energy state, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, to the fourth energy state, that is your bracket series. And likewise, whenever electron jumps from any higher energy state, like sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, to the fifth energy state, that is your P fun, or some people also prefer to call it fund series. Okay, and do my do remember Pustin bracket P fund series of lines falls in the infrared region. That is, we cannot see the those line spectra. Okay, so this is all about your hydrogen spectrum, and with this, we come so to say to the end of atomic physics. Thank you.